Thank you. Don't you worry. Get him out on Tuesday. Where's Loretta? Get the labor out on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Hello, good much again. Get the YDs out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Get labor out. That concludes our coverage of a Maryland campaign speech by Democratic presidential candidate Tom Harkin. Coming up next, we take you to Spelman College in Atlanta for remarks by one of Mr. Harkin's rivals, Senator Bob Carey of Nebraska. I'm thankful for a lot of things today. I'm thankful that uh, Bob Carey is not running against David Lucas and Abel Mabel Thomas for the presidency. He's running against only normal human beings. What an exciting time here in the South to have a victor from another portion of the uh, southern United States, South Dakota. <laughs> come south and win this part of the southern portion of this great country. I'm delighted to share the podium and the stage here with Abel Mabel Thomas from Atlanta and David Lucas from Macon and Tommy Irvin, who heads up our agriculture department, represents thousands of farmers out there who are struggling and looking for hope. I think David was right. A lot of things wrong with America, but on this stage today, you have a wonderful opportunity to see an incredible human being, Bob Carey, who exemplifies the best that this country has to offer. <laughs> and I'm proud of him. I can't help but think that all of my fellow veterans up here on the stage, especially Vietnam veterans, and all those 660,000 veterans in the state of Georgia, especially those 350,000 of which served in uniform during the Vietnam era, can't be especially proud today. I think they can be especially proud of a man who acquitted himself well, who was weighed in the balance in the cauldron of war and found not wanting and has not one thing to apologize for in serving in the war of his generation. I think we're special. I think we as Vietnam veterans especially have a lot to be grateful for and thankful for today with Bob Carey coming to Georgia. This is a special part of the world. This part, this region of America, sent proportionally over the last century more young Americans to the military than any other portion of America. This is a part of the world that appreciates the concept of what Jack Kennedy said to and that is, ask not what you can do for yourself, but what you can do for your country. Bob Carey answered that call. For him, it was military service. It brought him to Georgia for his first time, down to Columbus, Georgia, to jump school and to ranger school, then on to underwater demolition training as a young lieutenant in the Navy, a Navy SEAL. Talking about climbing obstacles, that's one of the ways in which he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, leading a team at night, up a 350-foot cliff against the enemy. But who are the enemy today? What's the enemy today? Unemployment, fear, loss of medical benefits around this country, fear of losing one's home, fear of losing one's family. Bob Carey knows how to tackle fear, and that is make a direct assault on it. You can't run from it, you gotta tackle it directly. He did that in Vietnam, he can do that as our next president of the United States. Let me just say, One of the things I admire most about Bob is that he came back and did as David Lucas said, that millions of young Americans have had to do after military service, and that is pick themselves up by their bootstraps. But Bob will tell you, there was a, a government waiting there to help with the GI Bill, 
I ran the Veterans Administration for a while. I know what this country can do when it really wants to do it to help out its citizens. And he got help, and he pulled himself up, and he went into business. He knows what business is like in this country. He put together a small business. Small businesses proliferate in this great state. A lot of people in small business today are struggling. Bob Carey knows what it's like to struggle as a small business person. Then he went on and ran and won a race for governor. He took over a government that was in debt, and he put it in the black, and Lord knows we could use that kind of leadership in Washington today. <laughs> in January of 1993, when I have a fellow veteran, fellow Vietnam veteran, a man who acquitted himself uh, with honor above and beyond the call of duty, to have watched him in this race go above and beyond the call of duty and win the Democratic primary and go on to the nomination and win the next presidency of the United States, my friend, Bob Kerry. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I love you. Welcome south. very much. Well, I'm going to have to take you on the road out there. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I appreciate your interest in this race. Uh, I appreciate your interest uh, uh, in what uh, we are trying to do as candidates. Uh, there's a story out in the West uh, that uh, I've told a few times uh, about a couple of hunters that uh, went out uh, uh, into Wyoming and they were out uh, pitching their tent and establishing their camp and put away their gear for the night and ate their beans and drank their coffee and all the other sort of things that you do at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, one of them starts to put on a pair of tennis shoes and his friend says to him, Jim, what are you, why are you putting on those shoes? And he says, well, Fred, there's a grizzly bear coming down over the hill. And uh, he said, well, don't you know you can't outrun a grizzly bear? And he says, uh, Fred, I don't have to outrun that grizzly bear, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> well, uh, that's a little the way uh, we Democrats have been acting at, as we run around the nation trying to campaign for votes and for delegates. Uh, but occasionally we look across the aisle and we see the Republicans gathering uh, their wits about them, uh, trying to make the case as well that they should uh, be the next president of the United States. And very often it's as much fun to look over there as it is to try to look on our side. Uh, George Bush uh, is, of course, the leader of the pack. Uh, the president's a remarkable individual. Uh, uh, his greatest weakness is that he is massively indifferent to the problems the American people face. Uh, George Bush and his crowd simply don't understand what a job means to most Americans. Uh, George Bush's uh, contact with working people growing up was occasionally bumping into the hired help. Uh, he still thinks... The president, unfortunately, still thinks it's possible to see a doctor merely by scheduling a round of golf. Uh, the president uh, looks out at America and sees us as political objects. He responded to the problems of the recession 18 months after the recession began and only when it became a political problem for him. Uh, he'll respond to problems with immunization. He'll respond with problems in health care only when uh, the problem appears to affect his political career. Uh, then we've also got to the two other leading candidates for office on the Republican side. Uh, we have uh, David Duke and we have uh, Patrick Buchanan over there trying to campaign. I understand Patrick Buchanan will be here in Georgia. Uh, I don't want to spend a, a great deal of time talking about the other two competitors on the Republican side. Let me summarize their message for you. Uh, Patrick Buchanan says America first. Uh, David Duke says white America first. George Bush says first. Where is America, anyway? <laughs> so, but if you are a Republican and you're worried about the president being able to hold his own, uh, you should not be afraid because every now and then when he gets in trouble, he can always call on that stalwart defender of him, Dan Quayle, to yeah. rush to the rescue. Uh, it was said by Jim Howard, Hightower here in Atlanta in the 88 convention that George Bush is a man who was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. Uh, 
<laughs> well, if that is the case, it can be said about Dan Quayle that here's a man who was born on third base and he thinks he's kicked a field goal. <laughs> and now... And now it seems to me as he rushes about the country, he's trying to steal second base. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm running for President of the United States of America because my strong belief is that an era has ended. Uh, an era of confronting the, confronting the Soviet Union with great military power and with great effort. Uh, much reference has been made to the war in Vietnam, which was a war that was fought as a consequence of that confrontation. And I must tell you that it is an enormous personal relief to know that it's unlikely my 17-year-old son and we'll have to fight in a similar war. We've also ended the decade of the 90s, where unchecked selfishness and greed and the attitude of saying that all we had to do is look out for number one and everything would be okay has resulted in us arriving in the year 1992, having witnessed a massive destruction of jobs and wealth and confidence in this great country of ours. We have ended an era and 1992 presents us with an opportunity to move in a fundamentally different direction. But the waters are uncharted in the post-Cold War era, and we have an opportunity that's been presented to very few people in the past, and that is to describe the world of our dreams, the nation of our dreams, and put in place the plans to take us to that point. Uh, I've been campaigning long enough to know that people are a bit frightened today, a bit concerned about where it is that we are going and what it is that we're going to do. Uh, and I'm running for President of the United States of America because I would like to describe to you uh, where I think America should be going. Before I do, let me reference my previous occasion to come here to the state of Georgia. I did uh, serve at one time and go through uh, Army Airborne and Ranger School and thus I have some uh, hard uh, acquired knowledge of the red clay and pine trees of Georgia. Uh, the last time I was here, they taught me how to jump out of a plane. Uh, uh, I no longer do such foolish things. <laughs> but I did, uh, at that time, uh, have uh, for a short period of time at Benning under my command, uh, a battalion of mostly inner city youth, none of whom in my judgment were over the age of 20, uh, who were on their way to Vietnam. Uh, and I suspect that a rather large number of those uh, young men did not come home. Uh, and there's, there's very little that uh, we can do today to uh, change that. Uh, their lives uh, have been uh, sacrificed for the cause of freedom. Uh, but there is something that we can do in America today for lives that are equally jeopardized. Today, before coming to Spelman, I went to Grady Hospital. Uh, and saw people who need us now. They don't need a task force. They don't need a study. They need our help now. It isn't... <laughs> and I tell you, it isn't as if we don't know what to do. Uh, you can go through the hospital in a very brief period of time, find out what is needed. We do need national health insurance that establishes health care as a right for every American and remove the stigma of having to go and prove that you're poor enough before health care is going to be provided. We do need to provide continuous health care for every single one of our babies so that they can grow up strong. And we understand uh, in 1992 that it's highly unlikely that George Bush uh, will answer that call. Uh, his duty is to get reelected. Uh, his duty is not to reach out and save the lives of those people in Grady Hospital and in the community surrounding it uh, that uh, are suffering far more than they need to do. George Bush has become the witch doctor of American health care. The man who brought us voodoo economics has been asking us to wait in his waiting room for 11 years. And I say to Dr. Bush, and we've been sitting in your waiting room for too long, in 1992 we're going to find you guilty of malpractice and revoke your license to practice in the United States of America.
Again, I tell you, it's not as if we don't know what to do. No, we know what to do. Everything, every single person who studied the program thoughtfully understands that we simply need to do what every single one of our industrial competitors long ago did. Establish health care as a right and then build the program around it. Uh, and you'll transform the nature of American society. Uh, but national health insurance for me is just the beginning of change. I must say, if we don't have the courage to stand up to the special interests that are going to surround and give us disinformation, I'm not sure we've got the courage uh, to advance to the other problems that we've got. But national health insurance is the beginning and not by any stretch the end of change for this great country of ours. Above all of the things, the people of the United States of America want jobs. They want jobs. <laughs> and they want jobs that will allow them to earn a sufficient amount of income that they can support their families, that they can get a little time off on the weekends, that they can have some free time with their families, that they're not rushing about hour after hour after hour, day after day after day, just scraping together enough to be able to get by. Uh, Americans want more than just uh, to get by. Uh, I've laid out uh, prior to today the details of an economic strategy that will require us to fundamentally change the way we've organized our government, fundamentally change the way we educate our people, fundamentally change the way we apply technology to shake the very foundation of our government to its core. Uh, and I believe we can increase the hope and opportunity and economic prosperity of this nation. What we have to do can be seen in what we've done in previous efforts in this country. We're not going to build any more B-2 bombers. The president wants to build four more. We're done building B-2 bombers. Right. But when you look... <clears throat> but when you look at a B-2 bomber, uh, when you look at that marvelous accomplishment of human technology and human skills, you see an extraordinary machine a machine that can do all sorts of uh, wonderful things. It has high performance capability. It's got only one single defect, and it's a major one. And that is that nobody wants to buy one. They cost $800 million a copy, and you can't sell them in a store. What we have to do is organize this government so that it produces products that people want to buy. Organize this government so that the people of America have jobs with meaning producing high-quality goods and services that the world wants to purchase. And I tell you, once again, lives are at stake. Our economic competitors have already organized, and they're getting the job done. And we've got to come with an urgency that says that unless we act quickly uh, to put in place domestic policies that create jobs in this country, that there'll be far more suffering than uh, needs to be. Uh, I'm running for President of the United States as well because uh, I believe that we need fundamental change in our foreign policy. For the past 45 years, we've lived in a world that it grew much smaller than it needed to be as a consequence of not being able to see beyond the Berlin Wall, beyond the Iron Curtain. Now, that was another world for us. And now the world has grown larger. And we need to advance towards that elusive uh, goal of world peace, towards that elusive goal of prosperity for the entire people that, 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 that occupy this planet, uh, not just because we care, but because it'll create jobs in America if we do. Global prosperity equals American prosperity, and world peace equals American opportunity. The days where we organize ourselves merely to confront an enemy are over, and we now have to organize ourselves so as to lift the hope and opportunity for everyone living on this earth. I'm also running for President of the United States because I believe in fighting for freedom. And it's not an easy thing to do. It requires you as an adult to look out there at some point in your life and say that there's somebody more important than you are. And that in love, you're willing to risk it all, if necessary, to make sure that their freedom is preserved. Uh, and very often, the freedom that is the easiest to deny is the freedom of individuals who are the weakest, uh, who do not have uh, very much power. Uh, and as I look across this great globe of ours, I still, still see uh, the battle for freedom 
uh, going on. But the battle for freedom is not just on this planet outside the United States, it's here at home as well. And I intend to fight for freedom against the right-wing Supreme Court that seems determined to take away every single one of our freedoms here in America. It is not the strong who need defending. They'll take care of themselves. It is the weak who need defending. It is the stranger, not the person who's made a contribution to your campaign, but the person you've never met before uh, who needs our help most of all. Uh, I did come back in 1969 from the war in Vietnam, and in spite of the fact that there wasn't a politician in America that I liked, this great country gave me health care and educational opportunity and allowed me to put my life back together. In spite of the fact that I had no political influence, this great nation was still guided by the values of a great society that says that every man and woman, young and old, have dignity. And we're going to reach out. And we are going to reach out to give them uh, opportunity and dignity. Uh, I'm running for President of the United States of America because I am painfully conscious, having talked with American families, that the status of working women in this country is perhaps uh, the most difficult of all. Uh, all those who had remarkable mothers understand that today in the 1990s it may be most difficult of all in the workplace for women. Uh, Ann Richards gave a terrific speech here in Atlanta in 1988. It may have been the high point of the political season. Uh, and she referenced this great dance routine of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire and said for all of you who remember, uh, that it was Fred Astaire who got most of the attention, and she said then, looking, I believe, to the men in the audience, uh, remember that Ginger Rogers did everything that Fred Astaire did, only she did it backwards in high heels. Well, I do intend to fight to make sure that women of America maintain their right to make reproductive decisions. <laughs> but I tell you, we very often fight that battle and then fight no further, and we must fight a lot further than that. Uh, again, at Grady Hospital, you see where the need is. Yeah. Babies whose mothers are walking away from them. Uh, babies uh, who uh, will not have a mother or a father because uh, their mother and father walked away from them. Yeah. Well, we've got to make sure that uh, working women in this country aren't tripping over inadequate health care, aren't tripping over inadequate child care, aren't tripping over inadequate transportation, inadequate housing, inadequate economic and educational opportunity. I intend to carry the battle far beyond reproductive choice to make sure that working women of America have each and every one of these opportunities in the 1990s. <laughs> Finally, let me say that this is about a challenge to this country of ours. I know that there's a great deal of pessimism and cynicism about whether or not this election makes any difference whatsoever. Uh, there's a growing number of Americans who are coming to believe that it does make a difference, that we can take the power of this presidency and use it to do good here at home, that we don't need to ask ourselves any longer what do we need to do. We know what to do. We just need a president who will rally behind us and help us get the job done. But before we can occupy the White House, we must nominate somebody who can win. We must nominate somebody. We must nominate somebody who's got the capacity to come without apology to the American people and ask them to give their last full measure of effort cause of rebuilding our neighborhoods and the cause of rebuilding our communities and the cause of helping our fellow man. Uh, we've got to be able 
uh, to nominate somebody who with the capacity to come and say that I'm asking for a sacrifice to rebuild this nation and I'm conscious of what a sacrifice is all about. Uh, somehow uh, George Bush was going to renege on his no new tax pledge, which we all know he has now done. The issues uh, did not become the American economy in 1988. Uh, they became something far different. And I tell you, I know an awful lot of people right now who are watching this race who, who are afraid to tell the truth, and I'm going to here today tell you the truth. And I've Bill Clinton is a friend of mine. He's been a great governor of the state of Arkansas, but if he is the nominee of the party, he will be the issue, and not the issue of jobs and not the issue of the economy. The Republican Party knows how to exploit every single weakness, how to lay bare your soul in the middle of a campaign where you're trying to carry out a cause of justice and a cause of change. And I tell you that in this campaign, I will tell you today, uh, that Bill Clinton should not be the nominee of our party because he will not be able to win. Yes. This is a truth that is largely unspoken, largely unspoken, but it is almost universally believed by those who have been through these kinds of things before. Uh, there's too much at stake in our great nation to risk again uh, this kind of disaster. Uh, I'm running for president of the United States of America because I intend to come to the people of the United States and challenge. Challenge us to accept responsibility for ourselves accept responsibility for our families, accept responsibility for our neighbors, and yes, accept responsibility for this great nation of ours. We... <laughs> we have a duty. Duty means that when you put yourself out there on the line, you accept the consequences and the responsibility for what it is that you're doing. Duty means that when the call comes, you answer it. And today, and today the call is not a war in Southeast Asia or a war anyplace else on this planet. And today the call is for a war that's going on right here in America. A war that can be seen in Grady Hospital today just as much as it could be seen in the Philadelphia Naval Hospital in 1969. There are casualties in Grady Hospital. Casualties of a war that we need to begin to fight right now in this country of ours. My challenge to you as President of the United States will be to take the best and brightest minds, the strongest and most willing hearts, and we're going to focus our attention not on producing weapons that the world fears, but we're going to focus our attention on solving America's problems, trying to make our schools work. We have a million children who drop out of school every single year. I visited Exodus when I was here earlier, and I know that we can make a difference. I visited Job Corps sites, and though it is a bit more expensive, I know they work. We know what to do. We just have to have the courage to do it. I'm running for President of the United States of America because I believe a growing number of Americans are ready to fight for what they know is right as well are ready to stake out a dream of a world changed as a consequence of our effort, a world that is a more just, a world where it is safe to walk our streets, a world where we can stand with pride and say that we're doing all that is humanly possible to take care of our children, a world where we can stand with pride and say that our, our parents no longer fear 
uh, that they are going to get wiped out as well. A world where we say with pride uh, that we've given it our all to make it a better place. I'm running for President of the United States of America because I will not divide this great nation. I will work to pull it together. I will work to try to bring out the best in each and every one of you because I believe that human beings can accomplish the impossible, can do the miraculous. They only have the courage and the opportunity to do it. Uh, I tell you in the end that I love this great nation of ours not just because of the wonderful things that we have accomplished, but because of the wonderful things that we do for one another. In the end, uh, we are not truly free people until we are willing uh, to share our great abundance. The pathway to greatness is not just acquiring wealth, it's acquiring the willingness to share that wealth with other people. It is still and always will be better to give than to receive. It always will be true that the moment of liberation comes when we are not afraid of losing anything. Now, when we understand that when we give ourselves to others, uh, that's when we become free people. Oh. I've learned a very few things absolutely in my lifetime. One of them is that there's no limit to what a person can do if they're willing to allow somebody else to take credit for it. And I'm here today giving you an opportunity to take credit for my victory next Tuesday. Right. Uh, it will be the beginning of our victory in November. I look forward to defeating my third incumbent Republican in November 1992. Yeah. But most of all, I look forward to the new beginning. We are going to seize the moment and build the world and build the country of our dreams. Thank you very much. That concludes our coverage of a...